Beep, 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 beep. Test one, two. Test, test, test. Yeah. Both cards are working. Check. Hey, there we go. Hey, good morning. We're glad you're here. Sorry we had a little technical difficulties, but uh, if you're here and you're a guest, we're glad you're here. Welcome. Uh, if you 
uh, throughout the service or at the end of the service. If you want to know more about who we are, there's some uh, cards in the fill out. But uh, see one of your elders, which is me, Michael, or anybody. They can point you in the right direction. We want to get you connected. But we're glad you're here to come and worship with us. And so would you stand with us as we sing? Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders shine to you who boast tomorrow's gain. Tell me, what is your life amidst that vanishes at dawn? All glory be, glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. His will be done. His will be done. His kingdom come on earth as is above. Who is himself our daily bread? Praise him, the Lord of love. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without price. We'll take a cup of kindness yet. All glory be to Christ. All glory. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. And on the day the great I am, the faithful and the true, the Lamb who was for sinners slain is making all things new. Behold, our God shall live with us and be. Our steadfast life, and we shall hear his people be. All glory be to Christ. All glory, all glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. All glory. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Thank you. 
said that he was praying, when he started talking to the company, he started saying all kinds of cute things about, you know, may your love be like this, and may your embrace, may you embrace each other about the company, may you know, and he started saying all these wonderful things. It struck me about 30 seconds into it, I had my head bowed, and I said, who's talking to him? So I opened my eyes to see if I was the only one in the congregation with my head bowed. I said, like, no, everybody has their head bowed. Here's me. So then I thought, who is this Mr. President? He's certainly about to get about. He's about to turn his prayer toward the one who he should be. But it never happened. It never happened. And then she talked to him, and he said, I'm oh, wonderful. And then he said, I don't get it. It struck me. That's not, we are fine to turn out the blessing over one another. But something different than prayer. Prayer is something that God will teach us. It's not just to go through the motions. It's something else. And as we gather together, we have an opportunity to come to Him. So I want to encourage you, church family, as we lift our hearts in song, let's lift our hearts in not just the sound of words. Let's engage God in worship. Let's sing this song together, church. It's familiar to all of us. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to bed. of angels sing choirs of angels sing in exaltation oh sing all ye bright hosts 
of Him above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet Thee. Yea, Lord, we greet Thee. Born this happy morning, Jesus, to Thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh of Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Oh, come. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Christ the Lord. Come thou day spring. O 
sovereignty laid at the Father's feet. Earth recognized your cry as worship filled the night. Son of God has come. Love now here with us. And glory to God in the highest. Peace to the weary world. Blessed is he who has come to save us, God in flesh and blood. Your hands and feet, your hands and feet were bound. Thorns became your crown. Love that molded us was nailed upon the cross. Every drop of grace was spilled out on that day. You were lifted high, oh God, the crucified. And glory to God in the highest. And peace to the weary world. And blessed is he who has come to save us. God in flesh and blood. Resurrection life You gave up your spirit To give it to your bride Resurrection life 
You gave up your spirit to come and live inside us. Resurrection life. You gave up your spirit to give it to your bride. Resurrection life. You gave up your spirit to come and live inside us. Resurrection life. You gave up your spirit to give it to your bride. Resurrection life. You gave up your spirit to come and live inside us. And glory to God in the highest. And peace to the weary world. And blessed is he who has come to save us. God in flesh and blood. God in flesh and blood. God in flesh and blood. And glory to God in the highest. And peace to the weary world. Blessed is he who has come to save us. God in flesh and blood. God in flesh and blood. God Sing about the Father's love. Your love is extravagant. Your friendship is so intimate. I find I'm moving to the rhythms of your grace. Your fragrance is intoxicating in our secret place. Your love is extravagant. Amen. Your love. Your love. is extravagant your friendship is so intimate i find i'm moving to the rhythms of your grace, your fragrance is intoxicating in our secret place. Your love is extravagant. And spread wide in the arms of Christ is a love that covers sin. No greater love have I ever known. 
You consider me your friend and you captured my heart. is extravagant your friendship is so intimate I find I'm moving to the rhythms of your grace, your fragrance is intoxicating in our secret place. Your love is extravagant. Spread wide and spread wide in the arms of Christ is the love that covers sin. No greater love have I ever known. You consider me your friend. Spread wide. And spread wide in the arms of Christ. It's a love that covers No great love have I ever known. You consider me your friend and captured my heart again. Captured my heart again. Father, we just thank you for your love for us, your great love for us, that which paid a debt that we could never repay, Father. Thank you for your son, that he came and that he died for us, that we may be the glory of God. Father, this morning, would you be with us, clear our minds, our thoughts, and allow us to focus on your word and be with Heath as he preaches clearly your message for us. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Got a little loud. Let me ask you, was this love extravagant? Amen. That's awesome. All right. Well, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn with me now to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, All right, so we're continuing in our sermon series, uh, God's Message, Our Mission, which uh, it's a systematic exposition through uh, what you've been heard called the greatest sermon ever preached. Now, uh, the Sermon on the Mount actually it, it gets its name from uh, the preface that, that Matthew actually gives us in chapter 5, verse 1, who tells us that he, being Jesus, went up the mountain and sat down, and then he sat down and disciples came to him. So, just as Moses ascended up uh, Mount Sinai to receive an authoritative word from the God that had delivered his people from their bondage in Egypt, so the disciples of Christ, and we, along with them, will ascend up this mountain in Galilee. Hear an authoritative word from the God who delivered from sin and death. Uh, in verse 2, we're actually told that he opened his mouth and he spoke. And so uh, the Lord has opened his mouth to speak with us. And let's go to him in prayer now to, to open up our ears to hear and our eyes to see and our hearts to pray. Let's pray. Jesus. 
just we, we thank you for uh, the word that you have trusted to be shared with us. We ask that you would incline our ears to your testimony. You would open the eyes of our hearts so we may see and be captivated by your radiance and your splendor this morning. And may we, by the power of your spirit, be given hearts that obey so that we might experience the fullness of your love and your most holy name. Amen. All right, so Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father. The word of the Lord. Alright, so Jesus has already told us in this sermon that uh, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, that will be satisfied. Isn't that a community? instigate that within us, this hunger and this thirst for righteousness that we would indeed be satisfied. But then he goes on to tell us that the righteousness that he's talking about is a righteousness that far exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, and he clarifies what that righteousness is by telling us to not be angry with our brother. He tells us to, to not even look at another man or another woman who is not our spouse with lust and intent. He tells us to uh, not to make commitments that we can't keep, to consistently be people of our word, to, uh, to say what we mean and to mean what we say. He tells us to embrace insults by turning the other cheek. That's hard. That's incredibly hard. In fact, he tells us to, to pray, not just for our friends and for our loved ones, but to pray for our enemies. And no, not to pray that the enemy falls and the crime set back to the but to genuinely pray for them. So we can see that the righteousness that Jesus is talking about, that it's not a uh, an apathetic, lackadaisical, morally lax approach to relations. It's not that at all. In fact, he actually summarizes what righteous living is by saying, he makes it clear, he says, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, to be righteous, is to be rightly related with God and with other people. It encompasses both the vertical and the horizontal. That's what it is to be, to be righteous, to be uh, rightly related with God in the vertical. So Jesus, he, he, he wisely calls, or I'm sorry, he wisely follows up this call to righteous living with uh, a solemn warning that we're not to attempt to, to live in this way, uh, not just in the power of our own flesh, but also um, that we're not to do it for the sake of impressing others. So we indeed are called to practice righteous living. Okay, we're to, to live out our spirituality. That's what we're going to do. Okay? So we're indeed called to be religious practice our righteousness, but we're not to do it for the sake of impressing other people. Uh, Jesus knows that we cannot be both righteous and hypocritical at the same time. Now, uh, last week we were warned about uh, giving with the wrong way. And, uh, you know, God doesn't, he doesn't simply care about only, or he doesn't only care about what we do. He also cares about why we do it. Um, our, our motives matter. Our intentions 
behind what we do. The reason why we do what we do, those internal motivations, they matter to God. They matter deeply to God. God cares about the intentions of the heart. And so last week, we, uh, we saw in this same chapter, we saw Jesus give us uh, an exhortation to, uh, to not do it for the wrong motive, or to not do it so that uh, we would impress other people by now, God doesn't need us to take care of the people. Do y'all know that? That God says that the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. He says that every beast in the field is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. God does not need us to take care of the people. Next week, we'll, we'll talk about fasting, but... And fasting is certainly a good thing, but God does not need us to fast. Okay? I mean, we can lock ourselves in a room and fast until we're skinny enough to be pulled through the keyhole, and it not benefit God one iota. He doesn't need us to fast. And more to our subject today, God doesn't need us to pray. Prayer is for, for our benefit. Prayer is, is, is for us. God doesn't need us to pray. Really, I mean, the, the purpose of prayer is to be seen for us, to be seen and rewarded by God. That's why we, we go to Him in prayer. Look with me now at, at Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. We're going to read the first couple of verses. Jesus says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogue and the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret, will reward you. That's a promise. So, uh, I guess a, a couple of months back, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who's a, uh, a relatively new believer. And uh, he was telling me about how he's really now beginning to uh, enjoy waking up early in the morning, opening up his Bible, praying, spending that alone time with God. We call it a morning devotional, but uh, he's, he's, you know, doing these things and he's really, really beginning to uh, enjoy the first half hour, however long it is that he's spending with God and in the Word, in prayer. He's growing in his relationship with the Lord and... Uh, He's really enjoying that, that fellowship with God. He's experiencing communion with God is what's happening in the morning. I mean, he's experiencing communion with God, which is awesome. I mean, that is awesome. I highly recommend that, that every believer, that first thing you do in the morning, wake up, spend some time with God. Um, but, you know, he was telling me about how in these, these morning devotionals, he's, uh, he's praying for people. But he was also sharing with me how he also has uh, an aversion to praying with people. Okay, so he's been praying for people, but he, has, he still has this aversion to uh, praying with people. And he was asking me if I thought that he'd ever uh, get over this aversion. And, uh, you know, me being the, the sensitive person that I am, I said, yeah, I mean, whenever you get over yourself. Uh, and he said, well, you know, well, what do you mean by that? I was like, well, I mean, I mean, it sounds to me like, you know, the basic issue is, is that you're concerned. The reason why you're not praying with people right now is because you're concerned about how you might sound to them. You're concerned that maybe your prayer will sound childish or, 
or maybe it will sound uh, inarticulate or, or whatever it might be, but you're concerned about how that person will see you. So ultimately, like Michael was talking about just a minute ago uh, <clears throat> with the pastor that was praying to these people, your audience, and what Michael was getting at is that those that, that pastor's audience was those two people who were getting married, the audience wasn't, wasn't God. And what I was saying to my friend is the exact same thing. I was saying, listen, your, your audience is ultimately the people that, that you're praying for. Your audience is not God. And, and that's, that creates a problem. Um, but I think if we're, I mean, if we're all being just completely honest, don't we all have this problem to, to one degree or another? I mean, aren't we all genuinely I mean, concerned about what other people think? I mean, sure, I think we, we all struggle with that. I mean, if I were being just uh, you know, full disclosure right now, I'm having to, to push into the back of my mind right now fears of what you might be thinking about me while I'm up here speaking. OK, um, I mean, I'm not overly concerned with it. I'm not gripped by fear, but I'm still having to push to the back of my mind uh, thoughts about what you or may what you may or may not be thinking about me uh, while I'm up here. And I mean, truth be told, I don't want to I don't want to say something stupid and then you think I'm stupid or you might think that anyway, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to say something offensive. And then, you know, one of you get offended. I mean, I want you to like me. I do. Um, and I think we all, we all have those, those feelings, and it's natural for us to want other people to like us. In fact, anyone that says that they don't care about what other people think, they're either lying or they're a sociopath. And they genuinely don't care. They, they have some kind of mental disorder, and they genuinely don't care. They don't value relationships. So, I mean, we all struggle with that, but, but here's the thing, and here's the, the, the real problem with that, is that if we're o overly concerned about, you know, how other people see us, well, then ultimately that, that will lead to an ineffective prayer life. Our misplaced desire to be seen by other people will lead to an ineffective prayer life. And, and, and guys, this is... This is this is so tragic because prayer is a priority for the Christian. I mean, prayer is, is absolutely necessary. An effective prayer life is essential to the Christian life. I mean, if we're going to uh, effectively live the Christian life, if we're going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God, if we're going to grow in our, in our relationship, with the Lord, then we need to have an effective prayer life. We have to. It's essential for, for all things in, in the Christian life. And uh, if we're overly concerned about you know, what other people think, then again, uh, <clears throat> we're really, really missing out. Because it, it's not just a, a priority. And prayer certainly is a, a priority. But prayer is also... a a great privilege. Think about how, how much of a privilege prayer is. We're given the opportunity to, to speak with a holy and awesome God. This is the God that literally spoke universes into existence. He, he, he breathed life into the Adam, this, this, this mud man we call Adam. He literally breathed life into this man. He's the God who, uh, as the Apostle Paul says, he, he actually calls things that are not into existence as if they were. Wow. Think about who your audience is. I mean, what an incredible privilege to be able to, to have a conversation with this person. That is an incredible privilege. And God, uh, you know, he, he, he promises to meet us in the secret place. 
You know, we, we sang that song just a minute ago about, about meeting God in, in the secret place. And God promises to, to come and to, to, He invites us to come and to meet with Him in the secret place and to have this, this intimacy with Him and to enjoy fellowship with Him and to enjoy conversation with the God who, again, speaks life. He, he speaks universes into existence. I mean, this is an incredible, incredible privilege. And, and when I say secret place, I don't, I'm not talking about some place that we, you know, that we duck off to and that we, we pray in private. I'm not talking about a prayer closet, although that can be a very good thing. A prayer closet can be a, a very uh, useful thing. Sometimes it's, it's extremely helpful for us to, to get alone with God and to, to go into a, a physical location where nobody else is and we can really contend with God in prayer. That's, that's an awesome thing. That's a great thing. Um, but I'm not talking about the prayer closet, okay? The secret place that I'm talking about and what I believe Jesus is getting at here is it's less about physical location and it's more about internal motivation, okay? Uh, it's, it's the, the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that we're, we're actually talking about this morning, the, it's a corporate prayer. Okay, so Jesus actually gives this prayer to his disciples. And when he says, you pray in this way, he's giving this prayer to his disciples, to the church. And he's saying, hey, you guys, all of you, we would, if he were from the south, he'd say, y'all pray this way. Okay, plural. Um, and so it, it's not necessarily about the person getting alone with God so much as it's about the internal motivation. It's about wanting to be seen and heard by God. So when we pray hypocritically, it, it, doesn't, just, <clears throat> it doesn't just upset God, but it, it actually it, it breaks the heart of God. Because we, we forfeit that blessing of, of meeting God in the secret place. In fact, uh, the word that is uh, translated as, as room here is the Greek word tameon. And it, it actually often refers to a, a wealthy person's storeroom, okay, where they, many of their, their treasures would be kept. Now, can you imagine what treasures your heavenly father the God of, of all has in store for those who, who come and want to meet with Him in the secret place. Church, do y'all think that uh, God has resources? Think He's got a few things stored up for those that love Him, for His children? I think so. Uh, in fact, the Apostle Paul says that, that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no human mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Let me ask you this. What can other people possibly give us that our Father can't? That's a, that's a, a terrible trade. To, to pray for the sake of, of impressing others, to be seen and to be rewarded by other people, that's a terrible trade. We do not want to make that trade of of missing out on the blessing of having communion, of, of meeting with our Father in place for uh, the praises of fickle men who will they'll sing our praises one minute and then they will cast us aside the next. That is a terrible trade. And Jesus says, don't go there. Just don't go there. So church, let's be aware of insincere prayer. Now, after uh, instructing his disciples in the proper motivation for prayer, Jesus then uh, instructs them in the proper form and content of prayer. Okay, so verses 7 through 13, which we're about to look at here in just a minute, are kind of what you might call the, the modus operandi for, for prayer. Uh, or another way of saying this is that uh, Jesus, he starts with why, 
and then he transitions to the how. So look with me at verse 7, picking back up where we left off. And Jesus says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So, uh, when we try to manipulate God, it betrays a, a, a lack of, of intimacy. Okay? Because to know God, to be in uh, an intimate relationship with God, to know Him is to love Him. To love Him is to trust Him. To trust Him is to obey Him. To obey Him is to be blessed by Him. When we seek to manipulate God in prayer, and you really can't call that prayer, but we're just going to give it that nomenclature for now. Uh, when you seek to, or when we seek to, to manipulate God, it, it betrays and that, that we don't really know Him. That we're not intimate with the goodness of God. That we've not experienced genuine relationship with God. Because why would we need to manipulate God when He's as good as He is? And, but we don't know how good God is if we don't actually know Him. If we're not actually experiencing genuine relationship with Him. And I think what Jesus is, is getting at here is uh, the difference between true religion and magic. And I'll explain both of those words here in just a second. So, all right, I, I realize that in our day, religion seems to have sort of a, 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 it's a word that has a negative connotation, like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not religious. I'm not religious. Uh, but really, it, it, it should not have a negative connotation. Honestly, whenever... People say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. They're really not saying anything meaningful, okay? Because uh, <clears throat> spiritual people have bodies, okay? We have bodies. And so whenever we express our spirituality with our physical bodies, that's a religious activity. So giving to the needy, praying, Fasting, all things that require a spiritual, I mean, all things that require a corporeal, a physical body are religious activities. They're, relig they're, they're activities that, that spiritual people with uh, bodies do. In fact, the um, Common English Bible translates verse 6 1, uh, the one that we just read just a minute ago, is be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. Okay, so the implication of that is, is that we do, in fact, practice religion. But we do it for the glory of God. We don't do it for the sake of impressing other people. Now, <clears throat> magic, on the other hand, or what Jesus refers to here as the heaping up of empty phrases... That's more, uh, that's more of a, like a, a, a formulaic expression of uh, words. It's more like a series of incantations. It's kind of like, hey, I'm going to say these words in this order, and I'm going to hit the right combination in order to manipulate God in order to get Him to do what I want Him to do. Okay, so it's like, hey, I've already, got, I've already got it all figured out. I know what God needs to do. And now I'm going to pray this prayer. I'm going to say these words. I'm going to say it in this way. I'm going to hit the right combination. And then I'm going to manipulate God into doing what it is that I already want God to do. Okay, that's, that's, that's not prayer. That's, that's manipulation. That's, that's magic. Um, and it's not only unnecessary, but it's detestable to God. In fact, in the Old Testament, for an Old Testament Israelite, it was punishable by death. Magic, sorcery, witchcraft, 
all of those things are, are actually offenses that are punishable by death. So God takes this very, very seriously. Um, and Jesus tells us, don't go there. How many of you remember in uh, the book of 1 Kings where the prophet Elijah has this sort of like high noon kind of showdown with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? Any of y'all remember that story? Yeah, and so yeah, it's like the prophet he has this uh, <clears throat> the showdown with these prophets on Mount Carmel and it, it kind of transpires like this. They're testing each other to see whose God is really God. And that, that question is going to be answered by the God who, who, who responds in fire, the God who consumes the sacrifice that they put forth. Okay, And so whenever the prophets of Baal, Baal, however you want to say that, whenever they uh, begin to pray, to seek to manipulate God, they start going through you know, the seance, basically where they're dancing and chanting and they're kind of, you know, going through this little process, we might call it, you know, rigmarole or, or, you know, they're going through this kind of abracadabra kind of process to get uh, God to respond. And they're cutting themselves and, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things to, to get God to respond. And uh, indeed, their God does not respond to him. In fact, Elijah taunts him and tries to get him to do more and more. But uh, my point is that, and oh, and by the way, the they died. So, you know, don't pray that way. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's not only unnecessary, but it's, it's detestable to God as well. Now, we think about something like that and, you know, we look at that and I use that as an illustration. And I mean, I think, you know, most of us would probably say, well, that is so far, for, so far removed from the way that, that, that I pray or so far removed from the way that anybody I, that I know prays that, you know, we don't, we don't need to worry about that. It's, it's a non-issue. Let me ask you this. Um, have you ever heard someone pray an, an, an absolutely absurd prayer? And then at the very end, they say, in Jesus' name. Like, it's a sort of magical incantation. Like, it's abracadabra. You know, they, they pray a prayer. It's an absurd prayer. It's certainly not, you know, in line or in accordance with the will of God. And then at the very end, they say, in Jesus' name. And you got to say it with, like, you know, power and authority. You say, in Jesus' name. And shake a little bit, you know. Um, <clears throat> no different. Now, listen, I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray in the name of Jesus, okay? I end probably most of my prayers in that way. Maybe not all of them, but I mean, I do, I end many of my prayers in the name of Jesus, okay? And we should certainly, whenever we pray, whenever the Christian prays, we should be uh, doing it in in accordance with the will of God, okay? We should be standing upon the righteousness of Christ whenever we pray to our Father. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? That's not what I'm talking about when I say that we should be praying in, in Jesus' name. Um, I once had a, uh, a gentleman come up to me after a church service. One day it wasn't a church service here. Uh, and he asked me to pray to God that uh, he asked me if I would pray to God for him that God would sick the Holy Spirit on another man who had spirit on a man that had cheated him out of some money. And at first I was like, what? Yeah. Uh, and Melissa was, was right there with me. And, and again, look, I don't think that there was any really evil intentions in this man's heart. I mean, maybe there were evil intentions to the guy that cheated him out of money, but uh, I think he was really just culturally conditioned to, to pray in this way. And of course, he asked me, he said, in Jesus' name, ask, uh, you know, command God to, to sick the Holy Spirit on this person. 
And I, so I had to stop and said, well, I mean, the Holy Spirit is not my personal Rottweiler. So I, you know, my pet Rottweiler, I can't do that even if I wanted to. Um, but that being said, I said, I will pray to my Father who is righteous, who is a God of justice, who is a God who restored. And I'll pray that, that my Father will indeed bring about justice within this situation. And that my God will make you whole. I'll pray that way. I'll... Let's be aware. Of... As children of God, we don't have to cajole God. We don't have to manipulate Him. We don't have to twist His arm. We can very, very simply go to our Father and make our, our, our request known to Him. And, and know that that our Father is, is he's listening, that He's eager to hear from us, that He's inviting us to, to come and speak with Him. So let's be aware of uh, ignorant prayer that doesn't uh, or that fails to, to take God's goodness, His character into account. And so with that in mind, Jesus says to His disciples in the beginning in verse 9, He says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So <clears throat> let me ask you, did, did you all notice that, uh, that this request is for uh, our Father to, to fully establish His presence here on the earth. Listen to those words again. Uh, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a prayer for our, our Heavenly Father whose character we know is absolutely perfect in every way. Who is, who is good through and through, and this is the children's request for their father to to come and to establish his presence on the earth in all of its fullness, to make the earth his home. We we've already seen that the the why of prayer is is heavenly reward, and 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 now we're seeing that that the father himself is the reward. Get that. Jesus says that you will be rewarded. And then He says, pray then like this. And the implication of the prayer is that the reward is God's presence. Guys, there is nothing more satisfying than being in the presence of God. He is our treasure and our exceedingly great reward. God's presence is, is all satisfying. The psalmist says, In your presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He says, I'd rather, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. God's presence is, is all satisfying. And this is a prayer to uh, experience God's eternal presence or the blessing of God's eternal presence. Now, and I hopefully you see that, but I also hope that you see that, that this prayer is a, a, is a prayer to experience the ultimate blessing of God's eternal presence. It's that, but it's also uh, a prayer to receive a down payment on that eternal presence. So, <clears throat> earlier, both Pastor Jason and uh, Pastor Michael mentioned Advent. We're in the season of Advent. And Advent is uh, it's, a, it's a season where we acknowledge the incompleteness of our redemption. Okay? Yes, Jesus has come. And He has rescued His people from the powers of darkness. From sin and death. And, and He has saved His people and He's 
Uh, <clears throat> he's purchased a bride for himself. And yes, at Pentecost, the, the Spirit of God fell upon the church. And we all have the, the those of us who are children of God, we have the, the Spirit of God living inside of us. But that's the same Spirit that the Apostle Paul says causes us to groan inwardly. Because we recognize that to an extent, our, our, our redemption is incomplete. We know we're saved, but if we're awake at all, we also recognize that our, our struggles in this world are real. Our struggles are real. I mean, turn on the news for five minutes and you look at it and you think, well, I think you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And so, we, but we recognize that that the struggles that we face in this life are real. And, and to de deny that would be absolute foolishness. But in the season of Advent, we recognize that, that we're experiencing the already uh, the blessings of, of, of the kingdom already. And yet, that kingdom has not been consummated. We're still, we're still awaiting the redemption of our bodies. We're still waiting on our, our loved ones who have, have since died and gone on before us to be raised from the dead. We're awaiting the, the consummation of the kingdom of God. We're waiting for Jesus to return and to reward those who have been faithful. We're waiting on Him to, to execute judgment, to separate the sheep from the goats, and to uh, reward His faithful. We're still waiting. And so again, we, we recognize the, the incompleteness of our, our redemption. And as we, we live in these times, there's this real tension. And we experience that, that real tension, not just externally, but we experience it internally as well as we struggle with our own personal sins. And so living in this way, it, it, it causes us to, to cry out along with John, the author of Revelation, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. But this prayer is a prayer that acknowledges that while we, we wait expectantly, that we might also enjoy a, a taste of tomorrow's bread today. That uh, we might experience the, the freedom of forgiveness now. That we might uh, experience the assurance of God's protection. And that He will ultimately lead us into that final blessing where we're experiencing the, the blessing of being in His unmediated presence. This is the, the children's request to experience the goodness of the Father's provision of His pardon and His protection. This is a, a prayer that I'll, I'll, I'll boldly pray over each and every one of you here. Look, unlike stick the Holy Spirit on them, this is a prayer that if we, we, can, we can boldly pray this prayer for ourselves, for our families, over one another, over the families here at the Oaks, over our church, and we can boldly pray this prayer and we can know that, that we are resting upon uh, the assurance, upon the authority of the Word of God. I love that the Word of God gives us models for prayer. More than one. The Word of God actually gives us the words of prayer. And so, yeah, I mean, we can boldly pray this prayer. In fact, uh, I'll tell you all one thing that, that my family and I have been doing for a little while now is uh, before we'll, we'll sit down to eat, together as a family or before we'll, we'll sit down and uh, engage in, in some sort of activity we'll uh, I'll pull up my little nifty Oaks Church directory app do y'all have that app it's a good thing to have so uh, especially if you forget somebody's name you can pull it up and you know, look up their name but we'll uh, <clears throat> I'll grab that little Oaks Church directory application I'll pull it up and then we'll select a family that we're going to pray for. And we pray over you guys. And so we'll, we'll choose a family. And, and then uh, 
I'll start praying. And so I say, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Booth family. And Father, we thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy with them in Christ Jesus. And, and Father, I, I thank you that your peace and that your favor is resting upon their home. And, and Father, I, I pray that, uh, that, that Blake and Jamie would, would walk in the unity of the Spirit. And Father, I, I pray that, uh, that you would cause their children to grow and to prosper in all that you have set them out to do. And Father, I pray that they would taste tomorrow's bread today. And Father, I pray that, they would, that, that you would guard their home, that you would protect them from the attacks of the enemy. And Father, I pray that, that you would give them the, the assurance of your presence. And Father, I pray that you would lead them safely into the eternal blessing that you have for them. And I pray in Jesus' name, because I'm standing upon the authority of the Word of God. Pray like that for my family, please. I ask you, please pray like that for my family. We need it. And so, uh, in the Father's house, no child lacks bread. There's uh, an abundance of forgiveness. There's no animosity between the children. No grudges are being held. Everybody has enough. Everybody is experiencing the Father's blessing, the blessing of His presence. Uh, <clears throat> so this is how we pray, but let me ask you. We pray for, for things to come to pass in this way, but, but then what? Do we simply pray and then leave it at that? I mean, is that okay for us to just pray and then and leave it at that? No, it's, it's not. It's... To pray this prayer is to say, Father, this is how we, we, we want it to be on, on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, to which the Father responds, okay, so great. So get on with it. There are serious ethical implications to praying this prayer. Hence, this zinger that, that Jesus gives us in verses 14 and 15, and this is the last thing that we're going to read, but let's pay really, really closely, uh, excuse me, close attention to uh, what Jesus says here in verses 14 and 15. He says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay, so again, there are serious ethical implications to this prayer. Uh, to call God Father is an incredible privilege that comes with incredible responsibility. That's usually how it works, right? A, a, an incredible privilege comes with an incredible responsibility. We're preaching that to our teenagers all the time, right? Get a car. You gotta, you gotta handle it rightly. It's it's a great privilege, but listen, it's an uh, <clears throat> it's a, a responsibility as well. And uh, have any of your parents, or maybe some of y'all are your parents now, and and you're saying this to your children that, uh, hey, uh, when you leave this house, you represent us. So uh, be mindful of how you carry yourself. Uh, represent us well. Okay? Well, for us to call God Father is to say that, that we identify with the character of God, and, and the character of God is revealed through the Father's children. So the Father's character, the Father's reputation is made known through the children. So the way that we conduct ourselves, it, has, uh, it, it, re it reflects upon our Father. And so there are, again, serious implications to, to praying in this way. To call God Father is uh, it's a, it's a privilege, but it comes with uh, incredible responsibilities as well. And, and one of those responsibilities and one way in which we 
uh, reflect the heart of God, that we reflect the character of God, is through forgiveness. But human forgiveness is uh, an essential. It's an essential expression of God's initial forgiveness. As a people of God, we're we're required to uh, to embody or to to live out our on earth as it is in heaven prayer. Because when we do that, when 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 we live as the people of God as the distinct people of God, when we live as a peculiar people, it, it prophetically, not, not pathetically, but, but prophetically says to the world that the kingdom of God has already arrived. Okay? It's a, it's a, it's a way of telling the world that, that God's kingdom has already entered into the kingdom of this world, and that is an invading the kingdom of this world. And so the life of the church is to be the most uh, forceful assertion of, of God's perfect rule here on the earth, that it has already begun. Now, I'll say this, generally speaking, uh, everyone agrees that, that those who've been forgiven so much as, as we have should also uh, forgive. And, uh, but, and, and that's generally not... You know, people don't don't have a problem with that. I mean, freely have we received, freely we give. Okay, that's that's typically not a problem. But again, listen to the the force of Jesus' statement. It's it's not just simply, hey, you've been forgiven, so forgive. He he actually says that uh, <clears throat> yes, we we definitely we should forgive, but rather he warns us of what will happen if we don't. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's a pretty straightforward, direct statement. Um, and so we see that human forgiveness is not only an essential expression of God's initial forgiveness, uh, but it's also uh, an essential condition of God's continued forgiveness. This gift that we receive, it, 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 can, be forward, it can be forfeited if, if not handled rightly. And I'll, I'll give you uh, an illustration of that. In fact, Jesus gives us one in the same gospel, in the gospel of Matthew, when he talks about, he, he, he speaks a parable about the unforgiving servant. And I won't get into the weeds uh, of that parable, but... Uh, for those of you that, that, that remember or maybe you don't remember, essentially there is a, there's a, a servant who owes this uh, incredible, the unpayable debt to a king. Okay? And the king calls him to account to, to pay his debt, and the guy says, I don't have it. And, and he, he, he pleads for mercy. And the king Wipes the debt out completely. Nothing else. Just wipes it out. Pleads for mercy. The king wipes out his debt. Then that same servant leaves, and then he runs into another servant who owes him a small debt. But as small as it may be, that servant can't pay that debt either. And so he asks this other servant for, for mercy. He pleads in the same way. And this same servant says, no. He shows him no mercy. So then the king finds out that this servant did not show mercy to the other servant, and so he calls him back, and he, he retracts his offer. He says, never mind, you got to pay the debt. And listen to what he says. This is Jesus' words. He's speaking for the king. And Jesus says to this unforgiving servant, He says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And so we see that this, this servant, he, he received an unconditional, 
offer of forgiveness. But that unconditional offer of, of forgiveness, this gift that was given to him by the king, was retracted because he refused to, to accept it and to really appropriate it in, in uh, sincerity of heart. The church that, that harbors unforgiveness forfeits its right to be called a church. Because the church is, is established, it's built up, and it is held together by the mercies of God. And so a church that refuses to show mercy to people forfeits its right to be called a New Testament church. The church that calls God Father must commit itself to the likeness of its Father and to the likeness of her or the likeness of God's uniquely revealed Son. We must be willing to forgive every offense. So let's beware of, of stubborn prayer. Amen, church? Um, Jason, if you guys want to make your way up here, you can now. But in closing, uh, I'll say that the Lord's Prayer is a prayer for the righteousness of God to be revealed. And we're told, the Apostle Paul tells us that the righteousness of God is revealed in the Gospel. He says, I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And that, that righteousness of God is that Jesus, the unique Son of God, that He came and He lived the perfect life that we could never live, that He died a debt that He most certainly did not deserve in order to pay a debt that we could never pay. The Gospel is, is that that Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of sins. He paid a debt that He did not owe. It was a debt that we most certainly could never pay. And so, as the church, we are called upon to, to follow Jesus and know not, not, not uh, dying for other people's sins, but for to, to forbear those sins, to bear one another's burdens, and to bear one another's sins. That's what we do as a church, is we bear each other's burdens. And look, there is plenty of forgiveness that is required. You spend any time in a church for any amount of time, and you know that, look, we rub each other the, the wrong way, we, we do things to offend one another, sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally. But the house of God is a house where forgiveness must be in abundance. Okay, And sometimes we have to forgive people, the people that, that were supposed to, to love us the most. We have to, we have to forgive those people. Uh, we have to forgive parents. And for those of us that are parents, we know that we make so many mistakes and that we've, we need our children to forgive us. And in the house of God, we've got to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because that is a, our witness to the world that yes, we are peculiar people who are always forgiving one another and who are living in harmony because of that forgiveness. And that's why I say that the church is established, that it is built up, that it is held together by the mercy of God. I'll leave you with this because I know that Forgiveness is uh, it's extremely difficult, especially whenever you know those that 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 we love and and those that are supposed to to love us the most do things that are are hurtful and and, and cause us to feel betrayed. And I, I'll I'll share this with you before I, I close. I know that uh, I had an experience with with someone in the church where uh, I was hurt deeply and had a friend come to me after these things had, had transpired and he said, Heath, uh, I, I realize that, that you're upset and I, I realize that 
uh, you were mistreated. What happened to you was, was wrong. You were treated unfairly. Uh, but with that said, know that this person that, that offended you, that never in a million years could he ever offend you as much as you've offended a holy God. And yet not anything is held against you. You know, a statement like that, it's struck. But he's right. When I think about how my sins have caused these eternal wounds to Christ. So we're told that even in heaven that He still bears those marks on His hands and in His feet. He will, he will forever be the Lamb that was slain. And we'll see His wounds. And I know that, that, that my sins created those eternal wounds that He will bear for all eternity. How could I not forgive my brother, another person who is a, another fallen, sinful human being for the light and momentary afflictions that they have caused me? Oaks Church, let's be a church where there is an abundance of forgiveness in this house. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are uh, so incredibly thankful that through the perfect sacrifice of Your Son, that uh, the insurmountable uh, debt that was brought about by, by our sins has been paid in full. Thank You. And we ask that now that You would give us the supernatural ability to uh, live on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, I pray that, uh, that You would grant us repentance Repentance and healing and life eternal. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to forgive as we have been forgiven. And Father, I pray that if there is anyone here this morning, uh, today that has not asked Jesus to, uh, to satisfy the, the debt that has been accumulated because of their sin, Father, I ask that uh, in Your great mercy that You would cause this person to tremble. Lord, I pray that You would cause this person to feel uh, an immense weight until they can no longer tolerate it and they cry out to You for mercy and for forgiveness. And with all assuredness and confidence that, that this prayer is made in accordance with Your will. We boldly ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, tongue can bid me this depart no tongue can bid me this depart when satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within upward i look and see him there made an end of all my sin because a sinless savior died my sinful soul is counted free for god the just is satisfied to look on him To look on Him and pardon me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one, risen Son of 
Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood with my fist. In Christ on high, my lips, my Savior, and my God. With Christ, my Savior, and my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. One risen Son of God, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Praise the One risen Son of God. of God, but we have the assurance that the Holy Spirit Himself will empower us to do that which we cannot do in our own strength. And so, praise the Lord. I want to share just a couple of announcements before we close our service and present some new members. Uh, and so, first of all, before I get into any announcements, it's good to see you guys here. I don't know. Uh, I know we had somebody stationed at the other building, just in case uh, somebody showed up at the other building. If you made your way there this morning and then came over. Sorry that happened. Uh, but let me, let me tell you something that you can do to make sure if we decide to move again, uh, you'll know. Or if we do anything, we utilize Remind. That's our primary means of communicating announcements, upcoming events, changes in plans, all of those things. And it's really simple. You don't have to have an app. You can download the app and follow at Oaks. DS, if you have the app, or if you just use text messages, you can simply type the number 81010. That's the number that you're going to text. And the message, at symbol O-A-K-S, Oaks D-S, and send that. And that will subscribe you to the group, and you'll get a text message anytime we send a, a, a memo out, a, a message out. That's our remind. Also, since Heath mentioned it in the sermon, his, uh, the church directory app. If you're a member with us, I hope that you know, uh, because you were told, if you don't know, it's your fault. Uh, you were told at the starting point class that we have a church directory app. You can find it in the app store. It's called Instant Church Directory. Regardless of what platform you use, there's an app. It's called that. And you'll have to log in with your email. Now, if you're visiting with us, or even if you've been coming for a while, you can download that app, but you won't have access to the app to see everybody who's in it until you actually become a member. Uh, memberships, beginning with our starting point class, that's how you begin that. Once you're entered into our membership, then you'll be granted access. And so just hang on to the app until you uh, walk through the membership process, and then you'll have access to it. But I wanted to remind you of that since, uh, look, we got some people joining the Oaks Remind right now, and I'm getting notifications. Good job, guys. Some have been members for a little while, and uh, I, I won't say any names, even though, even though I see them right here. Um, 
Also wanted to mention that we do have youth service here tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, so just so you guys are aware and those who may be listening online, the uh, service, as you come in, we're going to go public school style. And what I mean by that is we're going to ask our kids to wear a mask and there will be checking temperatures for the safety of those everybody. Um, So come in with a mask and we'll read temperatures uh, as you come. We will also, that's six to eight tonight. There will be food. Uh, Also remember your scriptures, the scriptures that you have been memorizing. You have several, you have to know at least two of these from James chapter one, verses two and three, verse five, verse 12, verse 22, or chapter two, verse 26. If you need to refresh those, come see me. I can give them to you again. You should know these. Uh, but come with those ready. Kids, that is elementary and, um, yeah, elementary kids and, and below starting at uh, four years old. We have kids men this Wednesday night, and this will be our last one before Christmas. So there'll be kind of a Christmas party uh, theme, and we are planning to have it this Wednesday. So we wanted you to know that. Again, that's Wednesday, 6 o'clock. And then I'm going to ask Stephanie to come up. We shared an announcement last week about a fundraiser, and she's going to give us a little bit of information because it's today. All right. Um, We are doing a fundraiser at Oak Point and Watson for um, a little boy. He's a um, friend of ours, um, Brent Ballard, his son Vito. He has leukemia. Uh, They just found out recently, and he's been doing treatment at St. Jude's. He is home currently, and I'm sure we'll be heading back up there at some point. Um, But we're doing a fundraiser to help raise money for the expenses of the hospital visits and everything. So they're doing a pastelaya sale. The pastelaya plates are $7. And then we're also doing a raffle. um, And those are $10. So I have um, these if you want to get them from me today. or Well, obviously today, but this morning. (laughs) Um, If you want to get them from me this morning before you actually go out there if you want to get the tickets for the plates um, or you can purchase them there either way, whatever you want to do. Um, and then I also have the raffle um, tickets as well. Um, we are also, oh, wait, that's the price. $7 Pasalaya, $10 raffle. Um, and that, like I said, it goes towards, everything is going to go straight towards their family. Um, one other cool opportunity that we have through this is Mighty Moms. We've kind of partnered with them. And if you would like to purchase a dinner in, um, in honor of a child through Mighty Moms, it will go, we're, we're actually going to be going and delivering food today to, they have a whole list of kids that we're going to just hit up their addresses and go drop off food for them. So if you want to donate a purchased plate for um, those kids, you can do that with me or at the benefit as well. Um, and again, they're located at Watts in Watson at Oak Point. One last thing, because none of y'all are busy today, I know, right? Um, If you, just by any chance, would like to make any deliveries um, for those kids and you just really want something to do today, let me know because we're looking for some extra people to kind of drop off because we've had a lot of donations for Mighty Mom. So we're looking for some more help to drop off plates for these kiddos. So, all right, I think that's Thanks, Steph. And if you want to get a ticket or help out, see Stephanie. Finally, uh, it is our joy to introduce to you the Rayburn family, and so I want to ask Justin and Allison, as well as the kids, Lillian, Thomas, Gabriella, and Tab, to come on up, and many of you know the Rayburn family. They've been with us for several months, and uh, they have gone through our starting point, and we have heard their testimony, and we affirm that they love the Lord. They walk with the Lord. God is working powerfully in their lives. And we as elders want to recommend them to you, church family, to be one of us, to be a member among us. And the way this works is as we recommend them today, you now have two. two, Can somebody? Thanks, Eddie. Two 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 weeks. weeks, two weeks to do all your investigative research, dig up the dirt, find it, If you have any uh, objections, you can talk with them, uh, which we would strongly encourage if you want to talk to them, uh, whether it's about an objection or a get to know you. Uh, If there's an objection, you want to talk to any of the elders, you can do that as well. And so I wanted to present them to you. I want you to see just what lovely people they are. And you extend the right hand of fellowship as they are becoming 
officially one of us. We're grateful for you guys. Excited about what the Father is doing. And so let me pray for us and then we'll sing. Father, we thank you for the Rayburn family. We thank you for the powerful work of your grace and mercy that you have done in them and for the way that you, through them, will extend it to others. Father, I pray that you would help us to link arms in true fellowship, to be the family of God that you've called us to be. And Father, we ask your blessing not just on this family, but on all of our families as we go out into the community of salt and light. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing as we go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a great Sunday. And don't forget to come welcome the Rayburns.